we live in a, a an I want it now culture. Now, and if you don't believe that, go to McDonald's or Burger King, Wendy's, and after you stood there 10 minutes waiting on your order, check your blood pressure. And we say, you know, why do you call this fast food? We're surrounded by instant messenger. We want faster internet. We want phone calls that are returned immediately. You want to know something? Don't learn it. Google it. Want another quickest way somewhere? Next time you stop at a red light, get your phone out real quick, punch it, ask the map. It'll tell you where to go. You want next day delivery? We can do it. In fact, Amazon is studying the spending habits of its customers so they can send the orders before you order it. <laughs> There's a professor named Ramesh uh, Siddharaman, and he is a professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He did a study. He, he went through 6.7 million internet users. And he wanted to see at the, the point at which the patients wore out when downloading videos. And so he went through all this and studied it. And here's what he determined. Patience fades away. You listening? After two seconds. At five seconds, 25% of the people who are downloading videos abandon it. At 10 seconds, 50% of the people abandon downloading. Why? Because we want instant gratification. We want things that come right now. We want to live in the moment. In fact, one researcher said we are now uh, wired to think about the short term and not the long term anymore. But listen, folks, that instant mentality has been around a long time. What's happened is that the definition and perception of instant has changed as technology has increased. And so now we want everything just like that, and now we want to live in the moment. Now, why do I share that with you? Because the implications of that are not just simply to the practical aspects of life, but they now extend to our spiritual lives as well. That, that we're so concerned about the moment that we often forget about what awaits. I've been in some stores that have had this, but I went in one store and it had this wall thing you put up on the wall of saying, here's what it said. It said, it's about the journey, not the destination. And so I headed for the manager. I wanted to say, you got one that's wrong. And Marcia said, you can't do that. <laughs> Folks, it's not. If you read this book, it's about the journey and the destination. It's both. And we want to share that today, and we're going to do that in the setting of faith, because we're talking about in all of this year the flow of faith and how faith works in our lives from the first moment that we exercise it in our spiritual life and accept Jesus as our Savior to the workings day in and day out in our everyday life. And faith that shows itself in our words and our actions, our attitude, the way we display ourselves to other people. So we're going to talk about living in the now and then, and we're going to go back to the book of Hebrews. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Hebrews 11, and as you do, recall last week, we walked through a portion of Hebrews 11, which has a lot of individuals, biblical characters, who uh, God gives us as examples of their faith. And we walked through several of them and talked about what they did and why they were there and how that applies to us. And, you know, often we go through Hebrews 11 and we read those names and so forth, and sometimes we don't read that in-between part. And one of those in-between parts is our focal passage today. It's verses 13 through 16 of Hebrews 11. And here's what it said. It talks about these biblical examples. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. And therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. 
Now, I'm going to focus primarily on verse 13, so keep your Bibles open to Hebrews 11, and we're going to talk about seeing what's ahead and embracing what awaits and confessing who we are. And we're going to begin with the statement that our walk in faith, in our walk in faith, we need to see what's ahead. You know, one of my greatest passions of yesteryear was racing bicycles. I, I loved it dearly. And, and even now, my favorite TV experience of the year is watching the Tour de France. When you watch bicycle racing or you participate in cycling, uh, one of the things that you learn about is drafting. You see, when you're directly behind someone else you, and, and you're there, it cuts down on the resistance and it makes it much easier to maintain speed. But you can't be 20 feet behind and get the effects. You've got to be right behind them. And so that means that you're riding right on the wheel of the cyclist in front of you. Now, when you get 40, 50, 60 cyclists in a group and you're all sailing along and you're all just an inch or two apart, a couple of things that are imperative. One, that you keep your eyes on that wheel in front of you, but you also have to be able to see what's ahead. And so you develop the ability to be looking ahead and also to be focused on what's right here so that if something comes up up there, you know that it's going to slow down. You have to be prepared for it. It sort of works that way in our spiritual life, and that's what I want us to talk about today as we begin. And I want you to look at the first portion of Hebrews eleven thirteen, and here's what it says. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them. As we read this, one of the things I want you to, to note is that for many, faith is a here and now thing. It's a reaction. Troubles come, trials come, sickness comes, whatever it might be. In that moment, we react. And for many, that's their only experience in faith. That is, in that moment of great need, they reach out, try to pull the faith off the shelf, put it in there to get them through. Now, certainly we need to rely on faith as we walk through the experiences of life. But faith is not limited to a here and now thing. Faith also looks ahead to what awaits us. I mean, Scripture tells us we live by faith. That means every day. And that faith means that as we see what's here, we also see what's out there. A great example exists in prayer. I mean, prayer is an act of faith. In many ways, it's the supreme act of faith. I mean, we don't see God. We don't touch God. But yet we, we communicate with him in a complete belief that he is there, that he's listening to us, and that he responds to us. And Jesus talked about prayer. And as he did so, he tells us that prayer is not only in the moment and what we ask for, but prayer is also what we expect God to do and what we look forward to. Now, if you want to keep your fingers there in Hebrews 11, I'm going to go back to Matthew 21 and share a couple of verses there that come from Jesus that really illustrate that point. Matthew chapter 21 I'm going to read verses 21 and 22. And here's what it says. It says, So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Now, in that setting, let me share couple of things with you. First, I want to share with you what this does not say. It does not say, name it, claim it, and get it. It doesn't say, all you got to do is ask, and God's going to do it. You see, it is impossible for God to be inconsistent with his nature. Can't do it. If I ask God for something that's not consistent with who he is, his plan, his purpose, and my life, not going to happen. Because God's just not somebody who gives out these gifts. He willingly wants to respond to our prayers, but it's always going to be done in a way that's consistent with who he is. Now, Jesus says, if you go to, you know, you can say to that mountain, be moved and you cast in the sea. Now, let me just kind of explain that to you. I would not suggest that you go out west, stand in front of a mountain for the next 10 years and say, get in the sea. It's not going to happen. 
Because that's not the point of what he's sharing here. What God's telling us, what Jesus is saying is that that which is impossible for man, God can do. And he wants us to ask him, why? So that he gets the glory and credit for it. And so moving the mountain solely to move the mountain is not in God's plan and purpose. But when we say to him and ask him those things that genuinely are in his will and genuinely bring glory to him, then God's going to respond to us. And he says to us this, faith's an important part of that. And it's not just faith that there's God up there who's listening, but it's a faith that there's a God up there who's going to do something. You see, when you and I pray, there needs to be this attitude of expectation. I mean, James makes it clear, folks. If you and I bow our heads and say, God, I want you to do something. No, you're not going to, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Well, you're right. He's not going to do it. Because he doesn't want doubt in our prayers. What he wants is this, this sense of, this feeling of anticipation and expectation that recognizes who he is and he's listening and he's going to respond in a way that he knows best. And our faith is not dependent on how he responds. Our faith is dependent on who he is. He says, I ask, specifically, make your request known to me. But if you and I say, here's my request, God, and if you answer it, then I'll have faith in you. It won't work. Our prayer is, God, you are God regardless. And I'm placing my faith and trust in you. And in our relationship, I'm asking you to do this. But God, you do what is in your will and in your plan. And either way, I will continue to worship you and place my faith in you. You see, the prayer that Jesus talks about here is prayed with expectancy and expectations and that's very important to us because those prayers are not focused just on our immediate response they're long term they're looking out there to what God's going to do and how he's going to do it all along the way and so that principle extends beyond our prayer life to our spiritual vision how we view things how we look at things in our world And you see, as Christians, our spiritual vision has to include what awaits us, what's out there. And for many, that's something that they would not disagree with, just don't want to talk about it. Why is that? Because death's a morbid subject. Because it's not something that's really uplifting. We've got to make sure that we have all those high notes. Let me tell you something, folks. Here's a chance. I'll give you a 100% chance all of us are going to die. It's going to happen. But we don't have to talk about it in terms of it being a morbid subject or something to be avoided. We can talk about death in terms of a gateway from this life that God has given to us to an eternal life with him that's so much better than anything that we have right here. And it's not something to be feared. We don't welcome it. We don't invite it. But at the same time, God says, I want you to look forward to what's out there. You see, we've talked as we've shared about faith, about all kinds of faith. And one of the kinds of faith that we talked about was fake faith. That's faith that professes itself to be faith, but it's not. And those who walk around and profess their faith and don't understand and don't have the hope that God places in us because of our relationship with him don't have real faith. We talk about the distinctions of the Christian life. Let me give you one for certain, and that's our view of death. That we understand death to be that moment when this life ends and a life in eternity with God begins. And followers of Jesus Christ have to look ahead in such a way that it presents an image of hope. And it's hope that's based in faith that evidences itself in in a certainty. You know, if you, if you turn on the TV, if you read accounts, you'll hear all kinds of people that say, well, you know, I don't know what's out there, but I sure hope there's something after this life. And I read these accounts, I don't buy them, but I see all these accounts of near-death experiences, you know, where people went and saw the light and all that jazz. And I always say, well, if it's near death, they didn't die. However, here's the deal. Your faith and my faith is not based on somebody else's account. Our faith is based upon this book and upon the nature of God and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, if that's what's out there, hallelujah, this book tells me what's out there. 
and that's good enough for me. And so that faith has to be based on that. I mean, Paul shared about the type of hope that we're to have in Romans 5, 1 and 2, and he says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So Paul says this, we've been justified. That means we've been made righteous with God. Our unworthiness has been made worthy because of Jesus' sacrifice. and Who he was has been credited to us. And because of that, we walk in a hope of what awaits us with God. So we need to look ahead and to see what God has for those who believe. And we need to embrace what God has for us. I mean, check out this picture. I mean, I shared it with the kids up here at the front. It's a pair of binoculars. We all know what binoculars are. They are these things that you use to magnify something far off so you can identify it and see it better. And they serve a great purpose. However, if you stick a pair of binoculars to your eyes and walk or move or stand still, here's a certainty. Your peripheral vision's gone. You don't know what's around you. You're focused on what's out there. And, and notice what he says here. He says, seeing what's ahead embrace what's await, awaits us. Look at Hebrews 13, second part. Embrace them. And we ask ourselves, what does it mean to embrace? Well, I mean, probably most of us would say that means to hold somebody, hug somebody. But you know, it also means this. It, it means to devote yourself to a cause, to just take it and make it part of yourself. And, and here, that's the meaning that we get as he talks about this hope and faith that's in us. He talks about what awaits us. Now, this is the Greek word that's used for embrace there. And it means to enfold in one's arm, to, to hold something very tight against us and to embrace what awaits. Why is that so important? And why would God put that in here and tell us to do it? Well, as we share about faith, you'll remember that from Hebrews 11.1, 1, it gives us a definition and a description of faith. It says this, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There's this conviction and this assurance in true faith. It, it's holding something so dear that we are absolutely certain of it, yet it's based upon not seeing it or touching it or our human senses but it's based upon the depth of our belief. And it's such an important thing. And, and, and some may say, well, you know, how can I do that? How can I really, really embrace what awaits? Well, let me give you an illustration. I, I want you to turn to John 14. If you don't have your Bibles, we're going to have it on the screen. John 14, Jesus is talking to his disciples at a time when, I mean, they're really concerned and worried. And in John 14, beginning in verse 1, as Jesus shares with them, he says this. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in me, believe also in God. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions, and if it wasn't so, I would tell you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to return. And I'm going to take you there with me so that you will be where I am. He says, you know where I'm going and you know the way I'm going. Now stop right there. Now those are vitally important words in a lot of different settings. But I want you to understand the setting that they are shared in because that's almost as important as the words. This is the night before Jesus' death. He's got his disciples together. He's just pouring himself into them. He's washed their feet. He's looked at them and said, one of you before this night's over is going to betray me. And they're taking all this in. And probably in that time, they realize in the solemnity of the moment, hey, you remember back there where he said he was going to be killed? And, and they're beginning to wonder what's going to happen to us. And all in all, it, it's a moment in which hope is beginning to fade and faith is diminishing. And they're wondering, what's tomorrow going to bring? Now, of all the things that Jesus could tell them, here's what he said. Listen up, guys. You have believed in me. You need to believe in my Father. I am going away. But listen carefully. I'm coming back. 
The reason I'm going is to prepare a place for you. And guys, you need to have faith in that. You need to have hope in that. You need to walk in that because it will get you through. In short form, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, guys, embrace this. Make it part of who you are. And Scripture tells us they did, and they had hope because of it. Now, when you go through this book, unless you find it, I haven't, anywhere where the disciples said, man, I wish I was dead. I'm going, I hope this life will end tomorrow. They didn't do that. I mean, they were prepared for it. They didn't invite it. Instead, they lived life to the fullest, to the glory of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So they said, I tell you what, we'll take the peace, we'll take the joy, we'll take the hope. That's an abundant life now. But we're looking forward to that time when we'll be with him. See, he promised that. A place awaited for those who followed him. I want to ask you today, you believe that? You better. God gives it to us. We have to embrace it. We have to hold it in our heart and, and clasp it tight to our chest, folks. It's not a parenthesis that comes at the end of life. It's a part of our life right now, every single day. Because seeing what's ahead and embracing what's awake takes us to confessing who we are. Look at the last part of Hebrews eleven thirteen, And confess they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, what's a pilgrim? You know, a, a pilgrim is a, a foreigner, someone who's on foreign land. Uh, in Scripture, you'll see words like wayfarer and sojourner. And, and, and some of us may read that and say, well, I'm not on foreign land. I mean, this is my home. Lived here so long, lived here all my life. It's my home turf. And, and you would be right about that in a sense. But if we have a vision that looks ahead and embraces what's around us, then we understand that this home is temporary. And it's unlike what God has prepared for his family. And he told us that in Ephesians 2.19. He said, therefore, you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You know, I've shared with you, if somebody said, what's one word that you would use if you could, to describe what you are, I'd probably choose pilgrim because we're passing through. And I used to think, well, that's neat. we got a dual citizenship. No, we don't. We're citizens of the kingdom of God. I mean, I'm blessed to be here. I don't want to be anywhere else. We live in a great country, live in a great place here, but this is not our citizenship. Our home is in heaven, and we have to accept that and embrace that, and we have to confess that. You know, one of my favorite songwriters is a guy named Steve Earle. He's a decent singer, great songwriter. Studied under Towns Van Zant, and I love his songs. He, you wouldn't put him in the category of a Christian songwriter. But he did write one song with great words, and it, and it, and it, it certainly has a Christian message. And I love it, and it's simply entitled Pilgrim. And in it he wrote this. He said, I'm just a pilgrim on this road, boys. This ain't never been my home. Sometimes the road was rocky along the way, boys, but I was never traveling alone. We'll meet again on some bright highway, songs to sing, tales to tell. I'm just a pilgrim on this road, boys, until I see you. Fare thee well. Lyrics to a song, but I'll tell you, they mirror pretty well what we read in Scripture. Our faith calls us to see what's ahead and embrace what awaits and confess who we are. And we can ask the question, how do we do that? And let me tell you one of the neat things. God does not call us to that and not tell us how. And in fact, in the very passage that we read earlier and have now been sharing from verse 13, he tells us that in verses 14 through 16. This is the how that follows what you're supposed to do. Listen to it. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. And therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Every now and then, by mistake, 
I go on a TV channel that's got Bill Maher on it. And, oh, man. But when I do, and he says, are you telling me that you think there's a heaven that's after this life? I scream out, I sure do. But let me tell you something, Bill. I've staked my eternity on that. What about you? What have you staked your eternity on? Instead, I'm going to live by the words of Paul in Romans chapter 1. He says this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We're going to share about faith all year long. Just so you know, when I get to 2015, if God lets me, I'm going to talk about it again. It's that important. You see, it's not what we can touch or measure or anything else, but it is what holds us together and takes us on this walk through this life with Christ and to the gates where we leave that faith behind and it becomes sight in the presence of God. And the Bible tells us about that. Here's how Job, Job lived it. Job said, for I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth and after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God. And David said it like this. He said, one thing I've desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And so I ask you, what, what about you? Can you see what's ahead? Can you look into your heart and definitely see a hope that says, not a wish, not a maybe, but a certainty? Listen up. If you can't, we need to talk right now. Because it is God's heart that you have that. And his heart is so filled with love that he did what only he could do to make it possible. Nobody else on this earth and nothing within you will span the chasm that sin creates between us and God. But one person did, and his name was Jesus. He's the only one who makes it possible for us to step from the stench and stain of sin into the holy presence of God. And here's what God said. You want to know how much I love you? One, I'm going to send the most perfect thing in all of creation and all of eternity. My son, by the way, he's the only one I got. I'm going to send him down there. He's going to walk. They're going to spit on him, spear him, torture him, beat him, and kill him. And I'm going to do it just for you. And here's what I want from you. I want you to believe. I don't want you to nod your head. I don't want you to say that's a good story. And I don't want you to say that's kind of true. I want you to believe it in such a way that you accept it and live it. That is, everything you do will be controlled by my son. That's belief. Uh, if you're here today and you look ahead and you say, I'm not sure what happens at that moment that God's appointed for me to leave this life, then you need to fix it. And you fix it in the heart with a conversation with him. Now, folks, if we look there and see that hope, the question becomes if we embraced it. When we walk out these doors, is it evident to a world out there? Do we proudly confess to them that, yes, I believe it with every fiber of my being that an eternity with God awaits me? We still experience grief. We still have sorrow. We still have trials. But what makes us different is how we walk through them and how we view them. We need to do it, all of us. We're going to have an invitation. Throughout this time, the Holy Spirit works on hearts. Believe it or not, he's working on me. I'm up here trying to preach, and he's pounding me to death. We need to answer him. We need to respond to who he is in the way that he says it. If God's put on your heart that there's a decision that needs to be shared with me or Brother Dale at the front of this church, then we invite you to come forward. If God's impressed upon your heart, a conversation with him right where you are, then you need to do it right now.